Thank you all so much. Um, <clears throat> we are extraordinarily fortunate this morning to have a, a real expert um, in the question of gerrymandering. Uh, and <clears throat> but before we begin, I'm going to gerrymander an issue that's sitting on your table, um, and and urge you to take a look at this list of events that are taking place in the town of Concord uh, in the next couple of months. A lot is going on in the town of political importance and of interest to the League and of interest to all citizens. Uh, I've taken the liberty of listing a lot of those. I'm going to highlight three for just a minute. FinCom on February 15th is having a discussion about the fiscal sustainability. And you will see from Tom Tarpey a, a little statement um, on this. It's a portion of a larger statement that he's made indicating questions about fiscal sustainability in the town. And if you are interested in that, um, please note where it is and its time. Uh, note that the League itself is holding a warrant review, uh, open to all League members and obviously the public as well, on, the, on our first Friday on March 2nd. And in the third of our Mapping the Road to Town meeting, uh, on April 3rd, Carmen Reese, who's amazing, uh, is, is going to be talking about the actual, how the board gets put together. It's going to be the, the third in that series, and she's pretty terrific. So uh, that's, that you will also see highlighted here um, on, this, on this sheet that is in front of you. Oops. Um, when, I, um, when, I was, when I was first uh, <coughs> seeing Mary Poppins, Little did I know uh, that um, the, the line um, that, that starts, no more the meek and mild subservient we, we're fighting for our rights militantly, never you fear, you know, you know, you know uh, take heart first, Mrs. Pankhurst has been clapped in irons again. Little did I know the implications of that song. I loved it, I thought it was great fun. Went, went around the house with our children who were, we taught singing it with them as we marched around the house. Um, I had no idea what Mrs. Pankhurst suffered um, in order to get the vote uh, for women. Uh, and a year ago, a hundred years ago today, actually two days ago, a hundred years ago, uh, Mrs. Pankhurst uh, persuaded, uh, with some, as Marge Daggett reminded us at a recent board meeting, um, <clears throat> Uh, with the help of the Whig Party, who, who wanted to make certain that they got, the, they got their vote, um, but nonetheless, uh, women got the vote for the very first time in England. Of course, you had to be over 30 and own property. Uh, and it wasn't until after the war uh, that, was, uh, that, that women were then, <laughs> were, were then able to vote <laughs> at an appropriate age and, and without necessarily owning property. Uh, this business about voting has been a long, has been a long struggle. Uh, and the, the person after whom our title is named today, gerrymandering, of course, is the son of Massachusetts. I'm sure you all know that. Um, Elbridge Gerry uh, was um, uh, created, he was from Essex County, and he created this first, what was described as a strangely winged animal of claws uh, <laughs> shape <laughs> that was the first gerrymandering district. He was to go on to serve as a vice president to our fifth president, Matt, James Madison. Um, and he was the vice president from 1813 to 1814, but then uh, died. Uh, so then he was only, only able to do that for a year. But it is, and it is his namesake, uh, a Massachusetts fellow, um, who, who, has, who first um, imagined uh, the advantages of putting com uh, a, a group of like-minded people uh, together in order to compel a vote. Uh, this is a, this therefore becomes, this is an old issue, it's not a new issue. Uh, it's an issue with which we've been living for a very long time in this country. And we have an expert here today. Uh, <coughs> Stefan Bader took the opportunity to go and hear uh, Mayor Bernstein speak at the Wellesley uh, League of Women Voters and was so impressed by what she had to say but he came back and said, my heavens, Diane, we really need to have her come. And so it is to Stefan that I now turn. He will introduce Mira, she will speak, and then uh, we will stand up and um, take questions from, from, I'll ask a couple from the league, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, Stefan, and then to Mira. Thank you very much. Thank you, and good morning. Um, acrobatics to get out of that tight seating here, but I hope everybody can see okay, and if you can't, uh, 
feel free to move your chair so you can see the screen. And I hope if you can't hear, raise your hand at any point and we'll try to get that addressed as well. Um, I, as uh, Diane said, I saw Dr. Bernstein give a presentation to uh, another league and she is with us today. Um, she is a member of the metric, sorry, Met metric geometry and gerrymandering group. She's on the research faculty at Tufts University and she received her PhD in pure mathematics from Harvard. But since 2008, her work has focused on using mathematics to solve social problems from exploring the effects of extending health insurance to low-income populations to combating slavery and forced labor throughout the world. Mir is also very active in mathematics education, and she loves getting her students to see that mathematics, far from being scary and boring, is powerful, fascinating, and highly relevant to their lives. And I trust you will come to that same conclusion. And without further ado, I present Mir Bernstein. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, this is the fourth time I'm speaking at a, a league meeting this year in Massachusetts. Uh, and it's always such a pleasure to see so many people interested in the subject. Um, and uh, the league, of course, uh, the national level, has been doing incredible work in this domain, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So it's, it's, it's really amazing for me to, to have this opportunity. Uh, so, as Stefan mentioned, I'm part of the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group at Tufts, MGGD. Um, okay, so, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, where does gerrymandering fit into the big picture of things? So, how do you elect a Congress? Uh, before you go vote, certain things have to happen so that you know who you're voting for and how many congressmen come from where. So, let's just kind of go through that. So step one is the census that happens every 10 years. Next census is in 2020. Uh, the Constitution says you have to count the people uh, and you have to figure out what percentage of them lives in which state. So the second step is reapportionment. Uh, that's when you figure out, according to the population of each state, how many representatives the, states get, the state gets. Uh, so a lot of people confuse redistricting and reapportionment. Reapportionment isn't about districts. It's about figuring out Massachusetts gets nine. Uh, so once Massachusetts knows that it gets nine, uh, Massachusetts then has to go and figure out how those nine are elected. And the Constitution gives us full freedom, gives the states full freedom to do it however we want. But currently there's a federal law since the 1960s that says that every state has to divide itself into districts uh, and each district will elect one representative. And the districts have to have approximately equal population. So that's the stage called redistricting. Uh, where we divide ourselves into uh, nine e approximately equal population chunks. Once we do that, then the elections can start, right? Then people know, okay, I'm running for this district, I live in this district, I vote for this representative, and each district sends one to Congress. So redistricting is the process of drawing new boundaries for electoral or political districts. That's the neutral term. Gerrymandering is the bad term. Redistricting is what you're supposed to do. Why do we do redistricting? Um, well, partially because uh, every census, some states lose and gain representatives, so you have to redo everything. But even if your state doesn't gain or lose a representative, the population within the state moves. And if you don't do redistricting, uh, then you end up, if you just keep the same districts year after year, as until the 1960s, some states did, uh, you end up, because of people moving around, Sometimes states would have districts that were 100 times bigger than other districts. Um, and so in the 1960s, the Supreme Court in its first gerrymandering decision, Baker v. Carr, like one of the most important decisions probably of the century, because the court intervened in the political process at that point, said that districts have to be equal population, one person, one vote. So redistricting has to happen every 10 years, whether or not your state wins or loses representatives. Now, gerrymandering is its evil twin. So gerrymandering is when you do redistricting, 
quote, to accomplish a sinister or unlawful purpose. This is a quote from the uh, Black's Law Dictionary. This is the official legal definition. It doesn't sound very precise, does it? Sinister or unlawful purpose. So why might you want to do gerrymandering? Well, there's three kinds, broadly speaking. Um, so you might want to do it, well, you shouldn't, but if you're evil, you might, uh, uh, want to do it to benefit or to disfavor a racial group. That's one of the oldest kinds. Um, so you might say you have a minority community and you might chop it up so that to put them in different districts so they can't elect a representative. Uh, you could do it to benefit a party, so that's par partisan gerrymandering, which is the kind I'm mostly going to be talking about. Uh, or you could do it to benefit incumbents. So this is called bipartisan gerrymandering, and parties do this all the time, where it's not one party against the other, but sort of both parties against the voters, where they basically say, okay, you keep your safe districts, we keep our safe districts. It might actually be proportional to the population, even. Uh, so the party, uh, resulting party division in the legislature or the congressional delegation might be proportional to the distribution of the voters, but each district is so safe that the voters essentially have no choice. So interestingly, these three kinds of gerrymandering have very, very different legal status. So I'm mostly going to talk about partisan gerrymandering, which is kind of in the middle. So racial gerrymandering uh, is very much illegal because we have a law against it. The law is called the Voting Rights Act, uh, passed in the 60s, one of the most important civil rights legislation in, uh, you know, in our history, basically. And it's been, uh, you know, exactly how it works is complicated. It's been interpreted in different ways. But basically, if your redistricting somehow disfavors a racial minority, you can sue. It will go to the courts. It will go all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will take care of it. So all the talk about the Supreme Court's inactivity and unwillingness to intervene with gerrymandering, that's not about racial gerrymandering. They've intervened about racial gerrymandering a lot. So that is very clearly illegal. Uh, on the other side, incumbent gerrymandering is absolutely legal, or at least the Supreme Court has said that it does not violate the Constitution. So a state can pass a law saying that you cannot redistrict to benefit incumbents, and some states have passed such laws. On the other hand, other states actually say that one of your redistricting criteria uh, is, among other things, to keep dis keep um, the shapes of existing districts. So actually, to benefit incumbents is an allowed criterion in many states. Um, but in any case, it is definitely not unconstitutional. So, uh, you know, uncompetitive elections, not unconstitutional. Okay, now, partisan gerrymandering <coughs> falls in this uncomfortable limbo where the court has said that it's, if you do it too much, it's unconstitutional, but how much is too much and how can you tell? And that's the whole mess that is being litigated out this year with many court cases at different stages. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about, the partisan part. Even though the racial part is extremely interesting and complicated and interacts with the partisan part in many ways. Okay, so if you've read anything about gerrymandering in the papers, you've probably seen pictures like this with red and blue squares. So I am no exception. I'm gonna tell you about a picture with red and blue squares. Uh, so this is what mathematicians call a toy example. Uh, we talk, a toy for us is something which you can actually understand. Uh, so, yep, so it's true. Uh, okay, so here's a toy example. We have a, a state of gerrymandia with 400,000 people. 45% um, prefer party red, 55% prefer party blue. And that's just if you count up how many red squares and how many blue squares there are, that's what it comes out to. And our goal is to split gerrymandia into four districts. So here's one way you could do it, nice and straight. Uh, and if you look then at what happens, then you can see that the proportions of red and blue in the dif districts are as shown over there. So District 1 and District 2 is majority red, District 3 and District 4 is majority blue. So you have two red districts and two blue districts, which seems basically fair, right? It's not exactly 45-55, but you can't have 45-55 with just four districts. The best you can do is pretty much split it evenly. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, and yeah, you get two red, two blue. Here's another thing you can do. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, very nice, right? Yeah. Um, so here, the districts are still equal size. All four are the same size. They just look weird. And in this case, uh, we have three districts where red wins and one district where blue wins. So even though red is the minority, in this case, they win three districts out of four. So let's just talk about what happened here. Like, how, how did this magic occur? So, well, one thing that happened, I'm going to see if I can, oh, look at that. It works. So if you look at this clump of blue cells over here, you notice that clump is big enough that if you put it in a single district, it would have been the majority of a district. But what happened is it got split up. So that's sort of the most intuitive thing you do, is you take a population that's big and you split it so that it's the minority <coughs> in all the districts. That's called cracking. But sometimes that's just not good enough, right? If you, if you can crack all your uh, enemy party population, that's great. But sometimes you can't. In that case, what you do is you stuff them all in one district. You basically, you say, okay, blue is gonna have to give a, win a district here somewhere. Uh, let's make sure that they win it with as many blue votes as possible. So if you look here at district four, that district, it's almost all blue, right? And you can see it follows the line of the blue population. So that district has been packed. So there's packing and there's cracking. So packing is when you stuff all your opponents in one district. So yes, they win the district. Uh, but that means that they aren't around in other districts uh, to influence the vote. Okay, so packing and cracking, you will hear that all the time. That's um, sort of the standard tools of gerrymandering. And they're not opposites at all. They're complementary, in fact. Basically, what you do is you crack what you can, and when you can't, you pack. That's, <laughs> that's what you do. So now you, you know how to gerrymander, go forth and gerrymander. <laughs> Okay, but let me complicate, right? remember the title of my talk is that it's more complicated than you might think. So let me complicate this a little bit. So we've been talking about gerrymandia that looks like this. But let's suppose gerrymandia looks like this instead. This is still the same 45% uh, red, 55% blue. It's the same exact picture. I mean, but just differently distributed voters. Okay, so let's try to district it the nice way. Let's count up. Huh. huh. Wait a minute. This is the outcome we were just railing against in the previous picture, where you had three red districts and one blue district that was packed. In the previous picture, they had to work hard to get it. But in this population, if you just divide it into the normal way, you get that outcome. So uh, well, let's say you're the blue party, and you're trying to redistrict. And you say, OK, well, we tried the natural thing. That did not go so well for us. So, you know, let's like adjust it a little bit. So if you adjust it a little bit, you can get two red, two blue. But guess what? At this point, the red party is going to say you're gerrymandering. I mean, why did you make that jagged line? You clearly did it in order to give yourself an advantage, right? So this is the beginning of starting to think, wait a minute, it is more complicated because do you want districts which are the nicest looking districts or do you want districts that give the fairest result and who decides what's fair? Uh, that turns out to be a much more complicated question when you think what is fairness. Okay, so let's just do a little bit of history here. So this is Elbridge Gerry. He's actually Gerry, not Jerry, so it really should be gerrymandering, not gerrymandering, but at some point it all switched. Uh, I want to say a little bit in defense of Gary. Um, so I just recently, totally unrelatedly to gerrymandering, found out that, uh, so I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he was our first congressional representative. Uh, 1790, I just happened to be looking up my district and I looked down to you know, the history of the district and I scrolled all the way down to 1790 and there was my friend Elbridge Gary, and I was like, hi Gary, <laughs> didn't know you were here. Um, he was a founding father, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was at the Constitutional Convention. He was one of the people who didn't want to adopt the Constitution because it didn't have a robust Bill of Rights. Uh, when it actually got passed by the state assemblies, he was one of the biggest proponents. He argued very actively for the Bill of Rights. Uh, remember, uh, he was Madison's vice president later. So together with Madison, he worked on that. He was especially instrumental in getting the Fourth Amendment, the search and seizure one. So uh, he, he actually was a pretty accomplished and good guy. 
except that this one thing is what he's remembered for. And even this one thing is um, something that actually the legislature did and he just signed. Now he shouldn't have signed it. But he later said that, oh, he wished he hadn't signed it and he signed it you know, with, with great misgivings. So excuses, excuses. But anyway, I just, I want to defend him a little bit because he did a lot of other stuff in his life that isn't justice. Anyway, so what happened was that in 1810, um, for the first time uh, since the founding of the Republic, which wasn't actually that long before then, um, the Massachusetts uh, Senate, uh, sorry, all three branches of the Massachusetts government, so the assembly, the Senate, and the governorship were in the hands of the same party, Gary's party. That was the first time because it had been very evenly split before. And that happened to be a census year. And so yes, they decided to gerrymander and Gary carved out this little district over here. And two days ago when I was giving a talk at Haverhill, I was like, look guys, that's you. <laughs> um, I was actually in the gerrymander, <laughs> giving a talk about gerrymandering, that was great. Um, and so there's that district, and uh, there's the cartoon, the very famous cartoon in the Federalist newspaper. So Federalists were the other party, um, where in true 19th century style, they went on about how there's this monster roaming Essex, and what is it? Is it a basilisk? Is it a dragon? Is it a lizard? No, it is a salamander. Um, and so, uh, so there is the salamander. And what Gary actually did, um, people don't know very much about this. Uh, so before Gary, there actually were no districts. What happened was um, Senate representatives, Massachusetts Senate representatives, were elected by county. And larger counties had more of them. And he was the first to figure out that if you actually make districts, the thing they were especially unhappy about was this, that he added Chelsea, which is in Suffolk County, to the, the Essex County district. So he was the first person to realize about districts at all, that if you draw the boundaries, um, then, then you can draw them to benefit yourself. But I shouldn't say he was the first, actually, because there's evidence of gerrymandering back, back from colonial times. He was the first person who figured it out and people noticed. Um, so he was the first person caught, that's right. OK. Uh, so, but of course, compared to that uh, salamander, uh, you know, uh, our modern districts are much, much worse. And compared to them, the salamander looks positively friendly. <laughs> OK, so let's sort of zoom out in the big picture. So here is redistricting how it works now. Um, at least in the bad cases. And sometimes it works well, but here is the kind of thing we're fighting for here. So corrupt politicians draw bizarre districts, leading to unfair representation. 49% uh, of the vote, 61% of the seats is Wisconsin in 2012. Uh, that's the basis of the case that's now, uh, with, whose oral arguments we heard in the Supreme Court. Um, and here is how people think redistricting ought to work. So first of all, you should have honest politicians. I couldn't find a picture. Um, I'll take a picture. <laughs> well, uh, let's just say that I couldn't find a picture where it was obvious from the picture. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, no, it's true. Uh, my representative is great. So, um, <laughs> so honest politicians are supposed to be ah yes, are supposed to be drawing neutral districts. And what most people think of as neutral are districts with nice shapes. So compact districts. That's the term of art in this field. Compact means nicely shaped. Nobody knows exactly what nicely shaped means, but at least intuitively. So that's a map drawn by <laughs> a computer scientist uh, who just, all he was trying to do was get the nicest shapes with equal populations. So, uh, so that's how people think, okay, it should look like that. And then it should lead to fair representation. And what is fair representation? Most people think fair representation is when you get about as many as the same percent of the seats in your legislature as you got votes. So you got 49% of the vote, you shouldn't get 61% of the seats, you should get 49% of the seats. Maybe 50, maybe 48, right? But that's what most people think is fair. Um, 
And so we think this is how it should work. Unfortunately, it's more complicated than you might think, and so neither of those is true. Honest politicians would not necessarily draw a map that looks like that. They wouldn't necessarily draw such districts. And even if you drew such districts, a proportional representation would not be the result. OK, so this is kind of what I want to focus on to say that we think that fixing gerrymandering will fix everything. But we don't, a lot of times, people don't actually know what they're trying to fix and what they can actually expect to be fixed. I'm not saying gerrymandering isn't a problem. It's a huge problem. Uh, but it's good to know what you can and can't fix and what is due to gerrymandering and what is not due to gerrymandering of the problems that we have. So uh, let's talk about first the shape part of this. So this is the honest politicians would not necessarily draw a map that looks like that. So here's some myths. So myth one, weirdly shaped districts are a sure sign of gerrymandering. That is false. So districts are not supposed to be blobs. Districts are supposed to track political communities, right? They're supposed to uh, represent communities of interest, right? So the idea of having a district is that there's a community of people who have some similar interests and they choose a representative. And the communities of people don't generally live in blobs. I mean, maybe out west they do. Las Vegas is a very nice blob-shaped district. Uh, but not around here we don't live in blobs, right? So here are some examples. So this is a very famous district, uh, sometimes called the Earmuffs District. This is Illinois 4th. This is Chicago. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it looks like a pair of earmuffs. But it turns out that there's actually a really good and valid reason for this district. The reason is that if you see the two earmuffs, the top and the bottom, those are both neighborhoods in Chicago, which are Latino neighborhoods, Hispanic neighborhoods. And uh, remember, we're supposed to, well, we're supposed to protect racial minorities, but more broadly, we're supposed to uh, combine communities of interest. And so it makes sense to combine those two neighborhoods. Each one of those neighborhoods is not big enough to be the majority of a district, but together they are. So combining those neighborhoods allows you to, uh, allows the Latino population to, to elect a representative of their own. Now, you might ask, why not combine them this way? That would, you know, why do you have to do the earmuff thing? Well, the reason is that if you, com if you were to combine them this way, you would cut apart an African American community. So if you have a Latino community here and here, an African com American community here, you can't, you know, you can't have two contiguous districts of a nice shape. The best you can do is have the African-American district like this and have the Latino district go around it, right? So there's actually a valid, com completely uh, correct reason. This is a good district, but it looks terrible. Here's another one. You might not even see the district here. It's this green thing going along the coast. This district no longer exists. Uh, this is California. And it's called the Ribbon of Shame, or it was called. Uh, and you know, California got rid of it, so I can't really defend it. But here's why you might, how you could defend it, and I think it's reasonable, right? <coughs> what is that district? That's coast, coastal property. So coastal property owners are completely reasonably can be considered a community of interest. They have all the people who live right on the coast as opposed to people who live inland have similar interests, and it makes total sense to enable them to elect somebody who would represent their interests. Right? So a community of interest is not necessarily defined as people who live nearest each other geographically. In New York, they have communities of interest living along subway lines, and that's totally reasonable. That's not gerrymandering. Like they, those are actual communities of interest. And finally, you know, as I said, we in New England are communities, our political communities, our town borders are not very rational. Uh, and so if, if anything is a community of interest, a city is, but there's Boston and it sure doesn't look very compact. So weirdly shaped districts are not a sign of gerrymandering, not intrinsically, not inherently. So just looking at a district and going, this is a weird shape, uh, should not necessarily let you just spend gerrymandering. But here's an even worse thing. So people think, OK, maybe weirdly shaped districts are not a sign of gerrymandering. But at least if we can have nicely shaped districts, we know there's no gerrymandering. That's not true either. <coughs> so with modern technology, you can actually draw nicely shaped districts that do all the bad things you want it to do. So here's an example. 
There's the North Carolina uh, plan that got knocked down, not in this most recent court case, but back in 2016, this one got down, knocked down for racial gerrymandering. Um, and look, it's very ugly, right? These districts are just terribly shaped. So they were told to draw nicer districts, and they did. This is a much nicer plan. These districts are, well, they're not squares, but they're the kinds of shapes that you could completely justify on the basis of communities of interest, right? The, the, the bottom picture looks much, much nicer than the top picture. The difference in terms of electoral outcome, zero, right? They were able to, when they had to, draw nicely shaped districts to get all the same goals, still three Democratic representatives out of 13 in a state that is basically evenly divided. So nicely shaped districts used to be a guarantee against gerrymandering, right? In Gary's day, people could tell that something was fishy because he drew a weirdly shaped district, and he couldn't have really done what he wanted to do without drawing a weirdly shaped district because he didn't have the kind of tools and big data to be able to engineer things very precisely. So in those days, shapes actually told you something. These days, shapes tell you very little. Um, well, why do we want compact districts? There might be other reasons to have compact districts. I'm not saying compact districts are bad. So first of all, it is the law in most states that districts should be nicely shaped. And as I said before, you know, you, unless you have to draw a weirdly shaped district for some good reason, uh, it's better to have a nicely shaped district because it will create a more coherent community. Right? You basically, the idea is that you want people who live close together. Um, it looks nicer and more reassuring. And uh, Justice O'Connor, in a 1993 very famous gerrymandering case, she said, redistricting is one area where appearances do matter. And it's, <laughs> and it's really true. Like, this was a big part of the case that, you know, when you have really weirdly shaped districts, it undermines people's faith in democracy. And that is important. Uh, so I'm not minimizing any of that. The problem is that uh, compact districts are just not much use in the fight against partisan gerrymandering anymore. So we want them. We want districts to be compact. But that's not how we're going to get rid of partisan gerrymanders. We want them to be compact for other reasons. So that's kind of sad. And this also undermines sort of every time I look in the newspaper and they publish another map with horribly looking districts going, oh, look at this, all this gerrymandering. I'm like, no. That, you're looking at the wrong thing. There may well be gerrymandering going on there. But if you're looking at shapes, you're looking in the wrong direction. OK, so that's that story. Oh, and one more thing. This map is actually would be a terrible map. If we could actually adopt this map, it would be terrible. Because think about what it does. It's drawn on the computer. It puts arbitrary boundaries to make best possible shapes. Those boundaries are going to slice right through the middle of Concord, for all we know, right? It's just ap optimizing some abstract shape. But it's not really recognizing the reality on the ground. This is why most people who do this stuff seriously don't think that the right thing to do is to get a computer to draw your districting plans. Um, you know, I'm a mathematician and I do a lot of computer science stuff, but it's the sort of people, the more you think about this and the more you know, and the more you also know computer science, you realize that looking for the optimal, the best districting plan on the computer is completely the wrong way to go. The constraints are just too complicated. It's much more an art than a science. So I will tell you later about a really good way to use computers to draw districting plans in a useful way. But using a computer to draw the best possible districting plan that they will, we will then use, that's not a good way to do it. That's not a good way to use math and computer science. OK. so. Neutral districts is what we want, but we don't know what they look like. OK, so here is the, I think, somewhat even more depressing part. Um, if you were to draw neutral districts, in other words, if you were to draw districts based on the right considerations, whatever those are, political communities, communities of interest, or even if you were to draw blobs, if you did the best you possibly could, uh, you would almost certainly still not achieve proportional representation. So. Let's talk about this a little bit. And here's where it gets a little bit more mathy, but not too much more. Don't worry. OK, so this, the big question right, when you're thinking about fairness of a districting plan outcome is what's the relationship of votes in your state to seats in your state? And I'm going to use the example. You can talk about one party or the other, Democrats, Republicans. I'm going to be talking the whole time about from the point of view of Republicans. So votes is the percentage 
of the public that voted Republican, so how many votes did the Republicans get in the state, versus seats, how many representatives did they get as a result, right? So people's concept of fairness is something like this. You get 37% of the votes, you should get 37% of the seats. You get 48% of the votes, you should get 48% of the seats. Again, plus or minus, like roughly 48%. 53% of the votes, 53% of the seats. This is, you know, every audience I've talked to from, you know, high school students to mathematicians, except political scientists, they know that this <laughs> doesn't work. But basically, uh, people say, yeah, like that, that's what seems fair, right? That's what we want. That's the whole point. And if you get 37% of the votes, but 0% of the seats, that doesn't seem so fair. And if you get 48% of the votes and 33% of the seats, that doesn't seem so fair. If you get 53% of the votes and 72% of the seats, that doesn't seem so fair, right? So this is our intuitive concept of fairness. Okay, does one of those look familiar to you? Yeah. 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 Which one? 5372, which, what's that? Uh, that is actually Pennsylvania. That's the most recent one. What about the first one though? That's us. That's us, right? Republicans uh, in the last election, uh, I mean, it's hard to tell because a lot of the dis congressional districts are uncontested. So it's hard to tell how many people would vote Republican if there was a Republican candidate. But if you look at the presidential uh, results, it's about 37%, but Republicans haven't had a seat in the Massachusetts congressional delegation forever and ever. So I have heard people say with complete conviction that this means that Massachusetts is gerrymandered. And I'm here to tell you it does not mean Massachusetts is gerrymandered. Um, so I should be a little careful here with the politician present. Um, there has, there's a lot of talk about the Massachusetts state legislative districts being gerrymandered and I don't, against Republicans, and I do not know if that is the case. There's anecdotal evidence. I haven't done the analysis. However, Massachusetts Congressional districts, which haven't been Republican for ages, right? The, our nine congressional districts are definitely not gerrymandered, and I will show you basically proof. But so let's just sort of, uh, so I'll show you proof in a sec, but let's just sort of look at this big picture and look at it um, from the point of view of, I'm sorry, high school algebra. Um, so it's not even algebra, there's not going to be any X's. Um, <laughs> We're just looking at it graphically. So if you want to graph votes on the x-axis and seats on the y-axis, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing people go, oh. <laughs> um, right, so uh, how, what percent of the votes you got is uh, left and right, what percent of the seats you got is up and down. So those three points are the three points from here. So the one at the bottom you see is on the x-axis and the horizontal axis it's 37%. And the y-axis is zero. That's Massachusetts. Okay. The one at the top is uh, Pennsylvania. The one in the middle is Minnesota. Uh, and that line over there is the line where votes equal seats. And that's the line that most people intuitively think our elections should fall on. Okay. Does that make sense? So if things were proportional, every election should be near that line. Maybe not on that line. Again, we can't expect perfection, but near that line. Now, the thing is that of these three elections, Massachusetts and Minnesota were probably not gerrymandered. And Pennsylvania was, probably. I mean, almost certainly. In fact, the court agrees. So yes, let's say it was. It was gerrymandered. Um, so, but, but they all look far from the line. And here's a bunch more states. And you can see that. So all the ones that are in red are ones where there are serious reasons to suspect gerrymandering. North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio. And yeah, they look bad. They look far from the line, right? In those cases, the Republicans got more seats than they got, vote, than, than they got votes, right? That's why they're above the line. But there's a bunch of others, the ones in green, which there's no reason to think were gerrymandered. Uh, and they're far off the line, too. Uh, they happen to be more in the Democratic direction, but that's, that's sort of, that's a red herring. They really weren't gerrymandered. Green herring, yes. Right, so they're green, I put them, I didn't make them blue, I made them green in the sense that they're okay, right? The red ones are bad. Okay, so, uh, so here's the thing. It turns out, and this is why the political scientists in my audience are never surprised by this, uh, that our election system, the system in which 
you vote for a single representative and the person who w wins the majority in your districts wins the election. That system, single member district plurality vote, uh, does not yield proportional representation. People in other countries know this. For example, I'm currently working in Canada. They're having election reform in British Columbia. And everyone there, their current system is like ours, and they want to make it more proportional. And everyone there, like people on the street are like, oh yeah, of course our system doesn't yield proportional results. We know that. Like, you might argue for it some other way. But like, their people know that from the system, the election system that we have and that they have is just not going to lead to proportionality. And here, nobody knows that because we're still talking about gerrymandering. But if you fix gerrymandering, you're not going to get a proportionality. So in our system, you get what's called a winner's bonus. So instead of expecting our elections to lie on this line where votes is seats, uh, we expect them to m lie more on the curve like this. And why do I call this a winner's bonus? Because you see, as you go from 50-50, this is sort of perfect equality, right? As you move to the right, that means as, say, the Republican Party gets a little bit more votes, it gets hugely more seats. And the same with Democrats, as you get a little bit, as the Republican Party gets a little bit less votes, so Democrats get a little bit more in this direction, they get hugely more seats. This is something that is a product of our election system, not of gerrymandering. So let me try to convince you that this is the case. This is not actually, I mean, the detailed math is hard, but the concept is not very hard. So let's start with Massachusetts, our favorite state. So uh, Massachusetts usually votes 30 to 40% Republican, and yet our representatives are usually all Democrats. So does that mean that Massachusetts congressional districts are gerrymandered against Republicans? So here is a very, very telling graph. So let me explain this graph to you. This is from 2000, because that's where I had the graph from, but something like this still holds true. So in 2000, uh, Bush got 32% of the vote. And every in this graph, every little dot is a precinct. So a precinct is like where your polling place is. So it's like a neighborhood. Think every dot is a neighborhood. And to the right is more densely populated. So urban neighborhoods are to the right, rural neighborhoods are to the left. Okay, and up and down is more, so up is more Republican, so up is percent voting Republican. Okay, so this is basically taking every neighborhood in the state, every precinct, but really neighborhood, and saying how densely populated is it, and where is it on the Republican Democratic spectrum. So the first thing we see is what we all know, that uh, urban uh, neighborhoods are more Democratic, right? This is true in the whole country. And it's so all the states would have this pattern. So that we already knew. But now let's think about what this tells us about the possibility of creating a Republican district in Massachusetts, a Republican congressional district. So how do you make a Republican district? Well, you need a district which is more than half Republican. How do you make a district that's more than half Republican? You need to make it out of neighborhoods which are more than half Republican. At least most of the neighborhoods in it have to be majority Republican, right? So. Where are the majority Republican neighborhoods? Well, there are this tiny number of dots above the line. There are not one ninth of the dots over there. Massachusetts doesn't have enough Republican neighborhoods, even if you were allowed to combine, this is like in the whole state, right? These are, these are not necessarily even close to each other. But if you were to make out a Republican district for Massachusetts from all across the state out of neighborhoods, you couldn't do it. There are just not enough neighborhoods where Republicans are a majority in Massachusetts to make a district out of it, even if you could do it over the whole state. So does that mean we don't have Republicans? We have tons of Republicans, right? They're all, all here. They're Republicans living in neighborhoods which are majority Democratic. There's 32% of them, in fact. But they don't live in a way that you can combine them into a district. So this begins to tell you why proportionality fails. Because even though there's a lot of them, it's the geography that makes it impossible. And you can see here that there's not, these are towns. This is not exactly the same thing. This isn't neighborhoods. These are towns. But you, you can see that there's only a few towns where it's majority Republican. And yeah, there's like a part in the state that's kind of, this is where you would try to do it if you were trying. But this is just not enough. And then there's a few here. But even if you combine all those pink spots, there's still not going to be enough. And you can't, of course. So are Massachusetts congressional districts gerrymandered against Republicans? They are not. 
maybe at some point they were, I don't know, maybe like the his historically there was an attempt, but right now that's not why we have the districts we have. So here's another thing, uh, another way to think about why you don't get proportionality. So everybody loves competitive districts, right? People say we don't like safe districts, we like there's competition, so voters have something to say. Great, competitive districts are great. So here's a picture in which, th the way I drew it is that, so there are five districts here, these five rectangles, and every one of them uh, is very competitive, but it's a little bit more blue than red. So currently in this picture, uh, red is 47% of the votes, but 0% of the seats. That's kind of like Massachusetts, right? There, there are a lot of them, but they're outnumbered in every neighborhood. Okay, well, whoa. If I switched, what did I do here? I just switched this star to red. So I changed the voters by a tiny bit. The vote changed from 47% to 48% Republican. And suddenly, the percent of Republican seats went up to 20% because one of the five seats is not Republican. Switch another star, 40%. Switch another star, uh, 60%. So what's going on here is that in competitive districts, a tiny switch in the vote can suddenly flip a district. And that means that the votes here are changing from 47% to 53%, but the seats are changing from zero to 100. So competitive districts are actually lead to extreme disproportionality. So people love proportionality, people love competitive districts. Those are actually contradictory. You can't have both. Um, and if you look at, these are the points corresponding to these elections. They go almost vertically up because this is going from 49% to 53%, but on the seats level, it's going all the way. Uh, and remember I told you about this curve which looked kind of really unreasonable before? Well, actually, it actually looks more like this curve now, at least according in this picture, right, this green curve. And here's this green curve, and our points, our elections actually fit pretty well on it, right? So what this is saying is that, at least with very competitive districts, these elections actually look pretty reasonable. Now, the fact is that's not how these gerrymanders were achieved. They didn't achieve them through competitive districts. But that is, does in fact explain Minnesota right there. Um, so the Supreme Court understands this, right? It might seem like complicated math, but it's not actually at all. The Supreme Court back in 1986, in its very, very first partisan gerrymandering case, uh, the very first case was brought uh, based on, you know, this party won a small, like a minority of the votes, but it got a majority of the seats. Like, this is disproportional, so there must be gerrymandering. And the Supreme Court said, the mere lack of proportional representation will not be sufficient to prove unconstitutional discrimination. And until I started thinking about this stuff, this bothered me a lot, because it seems like here we are all going screaming about, we don't have a standard, we don't have a standard. Where meanwhile, every day we read in the papers how a party that got 51% of the seats got 80% of the votes. What's going on? Why do you need a standard? Isn't it obvious? Like 51% shouldn't lead to 80%, except that it's not obvious. It's in fact wrong. 51% can lead to 80%, and it's fine if it does in principle, right? So they say uh, if all or most of the districts are competitive, even a narrow statewide preference for either party would produce an overwhelming majority for the winning party. So the Supreme Court is right not to want proportionality or not to demand proportionality because our system does not automatically produce proportionality. In fact, it's very unlikely to produce proportionality. And again, people in other countries know this and have reformed their voting system as a result. Ireland has reformed it, Australia has reformed it, New Zealand has reformed it, Canada is on its way. Soon it's just gonna be us and England left. <laughs> Uh, and most of Europe is already on proportional representation. Like the, this, the countries with systems like ours are all descendants of Great Britain, British colonies. And we and England are holding on to it the longest. Scotland and Wales have all reformed. Uh, and Canada's getting there. Um, anyway, so here's the thing. There isn't actually, you know, so I was trying to convince you that maybe it's this curve. In fact, there isn't any one curve because depending on how competitive your elections are, you will get different results. So it could be a curve like that, or it could be a curve like that, or it could even be a curve like that. The point is, there isn't any one correct curve. The curve depends, like where you want your elections to end up very much depends on the geographic realities on the ground. And so if you just look 
at a particular election and say, oh, you got this many votes and this many seats, that seems unfair. That is not a valid way to say something is unfair. So every time you read in the paper, oh, clearly there was gerrymandering because they got this many votes and this many seats, you should take that with a grain of salt. There are other reasons maybe to suspect gerrymandering, but that fact in itself is no more an indication of gerrymandering than weirdly shaped districts. Right? So all the things you thought were clear indications of gerrymandering aren't. <laughs> that doesn't mean there's no gerrymandering. It's just that it's more complicated than you think. Um, and you might ask, well, OK, fine. But what if in the worst case, where a party actually wins a minority of the votes and gets a majority of the seats, that shouldn't be on any curve. Can that happen? And the fact is, that's not on any hypothetical curve, but it's very close to some curves. And remember, we're, we're OK with slight deviation. So here's an example. So back to our competitive districts. So this is where we got to where we had made two of the districts red. OK? Now, uh, look at these two stars. Right, right now, we're at 49% uh, red votes, 40% red seats. Now, what if I just switch those two stars? So see it? Switching stars. What actually happens is that this district turned red, but this district switching the red star to a blue star did nothing because it was already blue. And now suddenly we have 49% of the red votes, same number of red votes, but 60% of red seats, which is exactly what we said was so unacceptable about Wisconsin. So in a situation like this, it's completely possible. There are situations in which 49% of the votes gets you 60% of the seats in a completely legitimate way. That just wasn't the case in Wisconsin. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying gerrymandering doesn't exist. I'm not saying it's not a problem. I'm just saying that a simplistic view of it isn't going to get you very far. So summary so far, our electoral system, the party that wins elections gets more than its proportional share of votes generally. That's the winner's bonus. The size of the bonus depends on the situation. So there's no way to say this bonus is, this much bonus is fair, this much bonus isn't fair. It's not uncommon. Uh, in completely honest elections to get, uh, for a party that gets less than 50% of the votes to get more than 50% of the seats. And you just cannot identify a gerrymander by comparing votes and seats, you cannot. Okay, so um, I'm sort of, so I, I have all these slides about the efficiency gap. Let me just say very quickly, uh, I don't, if, you can ask me later and I can go through these slides, but basically the efficiency gap was this new, um, standard that was introduced in 2015 and was used in the Wisconsin case. Uh, and the way the media reported it is that it was used and it's what won the Wisconsin case. But in fact, that wasn't the case. Um, the judges were very uh, skeptical about it and with good reason. And when they actually appealed it the, uh, to the Supreme Court, they kind of said, oh no, we're not just using the efficiency gap, we're using other things too. Supreme Court was skeptical about it, all with good reason. This standard uh, that has been reported so much in the news as the math that solved gerrymandering actually is a terrible standard, uh, should not be used, uh, and people are now starting to back away from it. Uh, in the Pennsylvania case that the league brought, they used this, but they used the efficiency gap, but they much more <laughs> used a different standard, which I'll talk about later. So I'm not going to talk about it in detail, except to say that it's terrible. Okay, so here's a, here's a better way of measure so if we can't say just you know you got this many votes you got this many seats it's unfair there's gerrymandering what do we do right like how do we how do we even measure fairness if you can't just look at the percent of the seats the party got and say it's totally disproportionate that's unfair um so the way that political scientists came up with doing this is called partisan symmetry and it's very smart and it's very clever it has a fatal flaw though but so I'll tell you about it because it's the right way to think about it, and then I'll tell you the fatal flaw, and then I tell you how to fix the fatal flaw. Um, okay, so so rather than saying, given this many votes, here's how many seats you should get. You know, if you got 55% of the votes, you should get 55 or 70 or 80 or whatever. As we said, that's not you don't want to go there. Instead, you want to say, um, you just want to say that uh, the plan treats the parties symmetrically. So you ask, how would this plan treat parties under different a different scenario? Right? So you don't just look at what happened, you look at what could have happened. 
So, for example, you say, in the last election, Democrats got a huge winner's bonus. That's maybe fine. Uh, would the Republicans have gotten the same bonus if they had been the winners? Or you say, in the last election, Republicans got a majority of both votes and seats. But if Democrats had gotten the majority of the votes, would they have gotten the majority of the seats? Right? So it's, it needs a counterfactual. It needs a hypothetical. And for that, you need to have some idea of how things could realistically change. So what is realistic scenarios? So what is a realistic scenario? So the model that political scientists have for this is called uniform partisan swing. And it's actually extremely relevant. So this is actually something that political scientists use, but it's also something that politicians use when they gerrymander. <coughs> they think of it like this. OK, we can't actually predict how people will vote. right? For all the talk about politicians choosing their voters, in fact, voters sometimes disappoint them. So we can't predict 100% how people will vote. But here's what we can predict. We can predict that Cambridge, Massachusetts will be a lot more democratic than rural Texas. Okay? So what that means is there's some geographic variation where with certain areas of the country more democratic and certain areas of the country more republican. And then on top of that, there is what's called waves, right? Where the whole country gets a little bit more democratic, where the whole country gets a little bit more republican, right? So basically you have sort of this Un uneven landscape and geography, and then the landscape, the whole landscape moves up and down. And this is the model that political scientists have of how voter preferences change. And it's a good model. You can test it empirically, you look over many elections, and it really works this way, pretty much. So now, if you think about this, that tells you what could have happened in a different scenario. So here's Wisconsin, and here are its districts. These are its 99 um, state assembly districts. And what I'm doing is, I'm taking the, whatever the, the actual vote was in 2012, and then I'm adding 1% of Republicans to each district. So that's like the whole state is getting more Republican by every district becoming a little more Republican. That's what's happening here, right? It's getting redder and redder, right? So, so you can see that, okay, now it stopped. Now it's getting bluer. You can see that districts, dark red districts go light red, and then occasionally a light red district goes blue. Right? That's because you've added enough Democrats to that district to flip it to blue. So what this means is that you can model, as percent of voters changes, which districts are going to flip. And that tells you, um, so you can draw this curve for the plan. What this is telling you is, as you vary the number of Republican voters uh, horizontally, you can see at what point, how many, at, at each voting percentage, how many districts the Republicans would have won under that scenario. And then you get a curve. So now let's compare these two curves. Okay? There's Minnesota and there's Ohio. They both have results that are far from proportionality. But the Minnesota curve looks a lot like these, fair, these curves that we had, right? these fair curves. The Minnesota curve basically says, look, as you get a majority of the votes, when the Republicans get a majority of the votes, they would very quickly get a lot of seats. And if the Democrats have a slight majority of the votes, they would quickly get a lot of seats. It's symmetric. Do you see the curve is symmetric? So whatever, however it treats Republicans, it treats Democrats too. Even though it's very disproportional, so the Democrats got only a slight majority of the votes but a huge majority of the seats, if the Republicans had gotten a slight majority of the votes, they would have gotten a, slight, a huge majority of the seats. It's fair. It's symmetric. Now, look at Ohio. That looks weird. That looks very asymmetrical. So let's actually trace that out. Here, the Republicans got a majority of the votes, right? We're on the right, and a majority of the seats. But if the Republicans had gotten a minority of the vote, they still would have gotten a majority of the seats, right? This gerrymander was designed so that the Republicans get a majority of the seats, whether they get a little bit less than half the vote or a little bit more than half the vote. They hedged the bet as they should have, right? Because you're designing these plans 10 years in advance. You don't know how things will change. So you can't just plan for exact, some particular exact vote outcome. What you need to do is to make a plan whose curve looks like that. That's called the seat vote curve. And that is exactly what a gerrymander looks like. OK, so this is great. This was proposed to the Supreme Court as a standard in 2006, and the court rejected it. So the court rejected it. Kennedy rejected it. Um, Kennedy rejected it for a bad reason. But there's actually a good reason to reject it. The bad reason 
um, is Kennedy said, I cannot rule that a constitutional violation has occurred under a hypothetical, right? Based on a hypothetical, right? Because this measure isn't saying, look, he, this election is unfair, because we can't tell from a single election what's unfair. This measure is talking about what could have happened, like things happened this way, but if they'd happened that way, what would have happened? And Kennedy said, but I can't rule that an actual violation has occurred based on things that could have happened. That is not a good reason, because what you really want in your plan, and the, a, a fa the fairness of a plan, you don't really want to talk about fairness of an election. You want to talk about the fairness of a plan. And what a plan is, it's a way to go from votes to seats so that any number of votes will tell you what the seats are. It's a kind of, it's already hypothetical. A plan is already hypothetical. And if a plan produces unfair results under different scenarios, that makes it unfair, regardless of which scenario happens. So that's a bad reason. But there's a good reason. <laughs> so, but here's the really, the good reason that, that actually Kennedy was right, although he didn't mention it, uh, to reject this standard. The problem is that you want symmetry, right? That, that was the whole point of this, is that Minnesota was, the curve was symmetrical and the Ohio was not. You want symmetry. The problem is reality is actually asymmetric right now in America. So you hear about this a lot. Here's just a standard quote from the New York Times. Liberal voters and racial minorities tend to be clustered in major cities and their suburbs, concentrating Democratic base in a smaller number of congressional districts, even when the districts are drawn in an even-handed way. So Democrats pack themselves, right? This is residential sorting. Re Democrats live in areas with overwhelmingly other Democrats, whereas Republicans live in areas that are Republican but still have some Democrats in them. And those, so here's a, an example of that. Here's Pennsylvania. You can see that the same, same kind of graph as I showed you before. You can see that in the cities, Democrats live in neighborhoods that are essentially 100% Democratic, right? 0% Republican. But here is rural Pennsylvania, and even here, very Republican places, it's not up at one, it's like at 80%. So basically, urban Pennsylvania is 100% Democratic, rural Pennsylvania is 80% Republican. That means those 20% Democratic voters, their votes are wasted, and that's an inherent advantage to Republicans. Now that's an excuse that all the Republican legislatures have been using, right, in all this whole cycle of accusations against Republican legislatures of gerrymandering. They've all been saying, but we know that Democrats pack themselves, so these outcomes that favor Republicans, that's just a natural product of geography. We didn't have anything to do with it. And the problem is that, how do you defend against that? Because it is true that they have a natural advantage. The question is, is all the skew as a result of the natural advantage, or did they actually have something to do with it, right? But if you aim for perfect symmetry, you miss this important part, and, and they're right to complain that aiming for symmetry, they actually complain aiming for symmetry is like a democratic ploy. And it's, I mean, I don't know if they're right or not, but it would favor Democrats unfairly to aim for symmetry. Uh, okay, so math to the rescue. So I want to tell you about a standard, a gerrymandering standard. And then this is actually not hard math. It's actually really cool and easy to understand math. Uh, and then I'll be done. OK. Uh, so I want to tell you about a standard that uh, is new. It's only a few years old. Uh, and until the Supreme Court case in Wisconsin, people weren't really paying attention to it. Uh, like we had talked to various political scientists and legal scholars about it. And they were like, no, 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 too complicated. Um, but actually, in all the recent cases, including the case in North Carolina, including the case in Pennsylvania, including the case in Wisconsin, this standard is quietly being used, and it's what the courts find the most convincing, and the Supreme Court was really into it and actually like talked about it in the oral arguments, even though the plaintiffs were not bringing it up. <laughs> the justices brought it up. They were like, wait, we heard there's this really good standard. Um, and it's new, and it's really promising, and it really depends on math and computer science. So here's the thing. So in the past, plaintiffs would prepare a demonstration map, right? So if I'm trying to prove that you gerrymandered, I say, well, here, look, I can draw a map which is so much better than yours uh, to show, to prove that you didn't have to gerrymander. But the problem is that you can just say, well, I didn't have to draw your map. Like, I drew my map. Just because you can draw a different map doesn't mean that I was obligated to draw that map. So now what we do is and there's actually hard math behind this. A computer can draw millions of random maps that are all kind of 
reasonably good, as good as the legislature's plan. So they're, they split as few counties and cities as the legislature plan does. They're, the shapes are as nice as the legislature plans. Uh, but they're random. They're just random maps. So here's some random maps of North Carolina and some more. Right. Draw lots and lots and lots and lots of random maps. Now, for each of those random maps, we know where the Republican and Democratic voters in North Carolina are, so we can take these hypothetical districts in these maps and figure out how people would have voted if those were the districts. And so for each map, these are totally fictional, I just made these up. For each of these maps, you can say, okay, in this map you would have had five Democrats and eight Republicans, and in this map you would have had four Democrats and nine Republicans, right? So for each of your you know, millions of maps, figure this out, and then make a histogram. So this part I said was fictional, this is real. This is what would have happened under thousands of different plans in North Carolina, randomly drawn plans, uh, in 2012. I don't know if you can see, but most of the plans, so you know, some plans give you five Democratic seats, some plans give you nine, most of them give you six or seven, which is half, right? There's 13 seats, so six or seven is half. North Carolina is very, very purple. Most plans give you this much. So now what you do is you take your actual plans, the 2012 plan and the 2016 plan, which was drawn later, but we can figure out what it would do. And you ask, where on this histogram would it fall? And the answer is it would fall here, off the histogram. In other words, if you draw a random plan, different things happen, but this doesn't happen, right? And so now, where's your defense that, oh, it's just the geography? It's gone. So. Here's Wisconsin, this is the actual plan off the edge. Now the interesting thing is Wisconsin is remember 2012 Republicans got a minority of the votes. But most of the plans, and this is, uh, this is how many seats they would have gotten out of 99. Their assembly has 99, so this is basically like percentages. Most of the plans give them about 55 seats. So they got a minority of the votes, but under a random plan they would have gotten 55 seats, more than half. That's because of the real, true Republican advantage. Right? So they were right in claiming that they had an advantage, except that that advantage should have given them 55 seats, not 61. So what this standard allows you to do is to disentangle the asymmetry that's in the world versus the asymmetry that was achieved by nefarious intent. So conclusions. Gerrybender is more complicated than you might think. Weird shapes are not necessarily bad. Nice shapes are not necessarily safe. Discrepancies between seats and votes are normal. Uh, Nonpartisan plans often lead to biased results. That's again, if you have a random plan, you will get a minority of you know, Republicans getting a majority of Republican seats just because of geography. And even if you eliminate gerrymandering, our system does not lead to what most people would consider fair representation. That's the saddest part of all. So what can we do in the short term? Uh, yes, we can keep fighting gerrymandering in court. This new standard is gonna work. Even if uh, the Supreme Court does not Decide, decides not to impose a standard. Uh, Pennsylvania showed us that we can do it in state courts, right? And this standard, again, was used in Pennsylvania in this most recent decision, and in North Carolina, and in Wisconsin. Um, and then, we can't just rely on the courts. You can work on redistricting reform at the state level. Most recently in Ohio and in Michigan, uh, they're actually achieving <coughs> results. You can get your state to pass laws that give redistricting to a commission, or that disallow the use of partisan data, or that demand uh, you know, competitive elections, whatever you want. But you have to think about which laws you want to pass. Because if you pass a law like Florida that says you're not allowed to use partisan data in districting, then you will actually get a Republican advantage in districting, which maybe is OK. Maybe you think, OK, the, impo the most important thing is for the districts to, draw to be drawn neutrally, and then come what may. Or maybe you actually want to use partisan data and districting to make things more proportional. So the important thing here is if you don't know all the stuff, all the trade-offs and all the difficulties, you're going to campaign for reform and in the end get not what you wanted. So you need to know what you're campaigning for. Uh, and then get involved in your redistricting process in 2021. So in 2021, after the census, there's going to be thousands of redistricting processes everywhere, at the state level, at the federal level, and the governments often want input. So like I know Massachusetts is planning to seek uh, public input. Uh, and you can actually do things at that level or hold politicians accountable if they seem like they're doing something nefarious. In the long term, 
It's not just about gerrymandering. Our whole electoral system is flawed. Uh, so we need election reform much more broadly than redistricting reform. Uh, and then what our group is doing, so MGGG at Tufts, uh, we are doing research on the, the math that's being used for this. We're running workshops to train experts and also training high school math teachers to teach this stuff to kids. Um, we're running hackathons to build software because a lot of times the politicians have access to expensive software that the public doesn't have access to. Um, and in general, we're building a community of people with quantitative skills so that in 2021, when this basically falls on our heads and everything is going on at once, there are people who are ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, it's a lot to take in, <laughs> an enormous amount to take in. You know, clearly, in, intuition is. Uh, in, when we first came to Concord, I, I learned that you don't say th th uh, th um, uh, thorough. You say thorough. Uh, you don't say th thorough. You say thorough. So now, from now on, we're all going to talk about it as gerrymandering, <laughs> as opposed to gerrymandering. <laughs> well, only sounds strange to the rest of the world. Um, but the, the, you've been fantastic, and thank you so much. Um, 161 mayors recently uh, presented a, a petition uh, to the uh, Congress saying that. Uh, the, the census right now uh, is not being done in an admirable way. Uh, there's tremendous concern about the fairness of the census on which so much of this will be uh, will depend. Can you speak to us uh, as a first question, then we open it up to everyone else. Can you speak to us about the consequences of a, of a poorly managed census, or a biased census in this country? Yeah, so the consequences can be quite dire. Um, so one thing that people uh, maybe are not fully aware of, um, although at this point I think people are getting starting to get educated about this, is when we say that districts have to be equal population, what population are we talking about? Are we talking about citizens? Are we talking about voters? Right? You might think that you want the same number of voters to be electing each representative, but that is not the case. It is actually the full population, citizens, non-citizens, children, immigrants, everybody. Right? And that makes sense, actually, more sense, because regardless of how many people vote for a representative, the representative should represent the same number of people. Right. Even if people aren't voting, even if your children, let's say, aren't voting, uh, their, uh, sort of their well-being matters as much as the well-being of any other person. And so what we say is a representative represents the same number of people, regardless of how many of those people are voting. So what that means is that if you have a... Um, a census that undercounts vulnerable populations, uh, which especially right now people are worried about immigrant populations uh, being afraid to talk to the government. Right? If, if those populations are undercounted, that means areas with immigrant populations uh, or vulnerable populations in general get fewer representatives. Right? And so those areas are systematically underrepresented in our Congress. So those states with larger populations like that will get fewer people like that. Um, so there is talk about you know, putting a citizenship question on the census. I don't think that will happen. I don't think anything like really egregious like that will happen. But I think that there's a lot of danger of just sort of mismanagement and mistrust. But there are a lot of people working on this. There's a lot of uh, civil society groups working on this right now. So people are trying to fix this in advance. OK. And I'll call you. Yes, start there, please. This may be a stupid question. No stupid questions. Um, how does, with the census, because we have an extremely large college uh, mm -hmm. population, I know my daughter voted in Wisconsin because that was who wanted to make sure her vote counted um, as a student there. What happens with the census since we are massively student-based? So they count students. Um, yeah, sorry, the question is, what about students uh, in the census? So if you have a large student population, uh, are, where are they being represented? And as far as I know, students can, uh, are counted in so the census asks you where you reside and so if you happen to be visiting somewhere then you don't answer the census students are in this gray area where they can be either one 
Um, and so I'm not sure exactly how this is handled, but in, regardless of how it's handled in the census, they can vote in either place. Right. Um, so, so, but if they're, reside, if they're residing in college housing and, but, and residing, do we, does, the, does Massachusetts census look? I, I think that students, it depends on what they say, basically. Like, they can say, I'm a resident, so. They'll get the, the notice. They'll get the notice, and then they either say, I'm a resident of Massachusetts or not. I need a tech lead. He's an expert in this. Can you speak to this, Anita, yeah. for a moment? I'll talk about an expert, but um, a retired town clerk. The, in the federal census, which is very different from the town census, um, and Massachusetts, by the way, is the only state that still does a local census annually, um, which is for another discussion, but um, which is always why our local population numbers are very different from the federal population, because the federal census counts prisoners. They do not count high school students who reside here. So students at Middlesex School or Concord Academy who live here are not counted in the federal census, and these are under the guidelines. If you're high school age or lower, you are not counted in the federal census. If you are college age, then you are counted. So the UMass um, residents significantly affect the federal population of the town Amherst. Um, it has nothing to do with whether you're a voter. And that, um, so some of those students choose to vote in Amherst, some choose where they where they lived before. That is irrelevant for the federal yes. census. I I had argued um, for um, several years, and I finally gave up that the 1,500 prisoners that are residing in Concord um, significantly affect the size of our local precincts mm -hmm. because we had to divide up the precincts for voting purposes by population, not by voters. So we had one precinct because of the 1,500 people who lived at MCI that was much, much smaller than the other. But we had to, couldn't have more than 4,000 people, men, women, and children, um, living in any precinct. So it really is, don't think of voting as the same as the federal census. So can, can I just, oh, is my, is my mic on? Are you sure? I don't think I am. Am I now? Oh, okay. I just want to say, so I don't know as much about students, but prison gerrymandering is a big thing uh, where you have a, a prison that artificially inflates the size of a district where the prisoners actually can't vote, and in fact their interests might be diametrically opposed to the interests of the people who do vote in that district. And, but so this is actually, a, there's a good thing that's going on here, which is that the census counts the prisoners as living there, but uh, I think this, they just came out and said that in 2020, they will also indicate that these are group housing, that these are prisoners. And states, if they want, can use this information for redistricting to not district them into that district. So even though the census counts them there, they also indicate that you, if you want, you can allocate these people to some other districts. And some states have done this reform on this. So New York now is very careful to allocate prisoners to their hometowns rather than the prison. I don't think Massachusetts is doing this yet, and we should. So this is something that needs to be solved on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, Judy, yes. um, you talked about community of interest in terms of gerrymandering. Judy, stand up. Thank you. Um, you, you. You talked about community of interest uh, in gerrymandering. Uh, where was that defined in law, and, and how are communities of interest? That's a great question. So community of interest is one of the, so keeping together communities of interest is one of the quote, traditional redistricting principles. And different states, so the, along with contiguity, so the districts should be not in several pieces, compactness, um, these are all standards that different states have to different degrees and prioritize in different ways, but all the states have some of these standards in their laws. So these are parts of state law, old state law. Uh, diff some states don't have a community of interest as part of their law, Massachusetts does. Um, the problem is they're never defined. Nobody knows what that means. And so it can be used, on the one hand, it is a genuine good thing to take into account, it's important to take it into account. 
Uh, on the other hand, it can be used to justify all sorts of things. So that's why, again, you don't want to look at shapes. You want to look at outcomes, partisan outcomes. Uh, Tom. You said there was a process that all the countries except Britain and America. What is it? Um, so, no, uh, first of all, hear that oh, sorry. He, he said what, uh, there's a process in all countries except Britain and America. What is it? So I, I shouldn't, like, it's not all countries except for Britain and America. Canada hasn't done redistricting reform. India hasn't, and there's a bunch of small countries. Um, so there are different processes for proportional representation. Um, some are better, some are worse. Uh, like our system, they, they have other flaws, uh, but people have been working on fixing those flaws. And one of the simplest ways is the one that's in use in Germany, which they came up with. So, so you know, the Allied powers uh, decided on a democratic government for Germany after World War II. And unlike, you know, generally these things are decided by self-interested politicians. In this case, it was decided by people who actually wanted Germany to succeed as a democracy. So they gave them a really good government. And the German system of government is as follows. They divide themselves up into single member districts like ours. So they divide into little districts. Everybody elects a representative in their district. But also, they vote for a party. And what happens then is you look at which representatives are elected, and you see, OK, maybe 60% of people voted for this party, but it got 80% of the representatives. So then you add more representatives to the parliament, additional ones who don't represent a place, so that to, to get it to be proportional, so that the parliament as a whole is proportional to how many people voted for each party, and still every person has a representative that they voted for. And you can even vote for a representative for party A just because you like her, and vote for party B for your general preference of which party. Wow. Uh, there's obviously so much to learn. I'm, I'm very sorry to say that the witching hour is upon us, and so we have to bring these questions to an end. I think we could all stay here and, and in fact, a, a seminar <laughs> of some length would be enormously helpful. Thank you so much. CCTV has just has just taken. Thank you, Tara. Uh, CC, Tamara, um, CCTV has in fact filmed all of this. Um, as for the slides that we didn't get a chance to review, Happy to send them. She, she will send them to us, and we will forward them on a Monday Member News to for people to be able to access those. Sound like a plan? Okay. Um, thank you all so much for coming out, uh, struggling with this very difficult, <laughs> now more complicated than I even thought, um, question. Uh, the, the League has filed several amicus briefs in Arizona, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. We've been very active with the help of the ACLU, and I think Louise just left, but um, at, very active with the ACLU in helping to uh, struggle and wrestle this difficult question. We'll all wait with great interest to see what the Supreme Court decides. And it is lovely to hear that they're so well informed. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.